Welcome to today's State of the State Elections Webinar brought to you by NCSL. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. If you would like to submit a question or comment at any time during the webinar, you may use the chat box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Send button. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero to reach a live operator. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Mark Wolf. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen, and good morning from Denver, everyone. Wendy Underhill and Morgan Cullen of NCSL will discuss how the voters decided among the 6,049 state legislative seats that were up this year and how the political landscape has changed as a result. And we'll bring you up to date on what voters had to say on the 147 statewide ballot measures across the country. After Wendy and Morgan finish their presentations, we'll throw the floor open to your questions. You can submit questions at any point during the webinar by using the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. First up to discuss the ballot majors is Wendy Underhill, a national expert on initiatives and referendum. She's an authority on voter registration, voter ID issues, voting technology, early voting, election metrics, and much more. When election time rolls around, she turns her attention to statewide ballot measures, those policy questions that voters see toward the bottom of their ballots that can have a huge impact on the lives of citizens and the work of legislatures. Wendy? Well, thank you, Mark, for that very nice introduction. And thank you to everybody for being here with us. I'm going to just tell you right off the top what are my three big stories for the year out of ballot measures, and then I'll give you a little bit of background on ballot measures and I'll spend most of my 20 minutes looking at specific results from this year. As for the headlines, number one, minimum wage. Number two, marijuana. Both of those are favorable with voters, and both of them have um, public opinion polling that goes along that same way. My third big story is that there's no voter ID and no marriage-related measures on the ballot this year. So I want to take a look at the types of ballot measures first. I think a lot of folks use the word ballot measures to mean citizens' initiatives. But in fact, ballot measures is an overarching uh, subject heading and initiatives, that um, gray portion there, is only one part of the whole ballot measures scene. And in fact, you can see the red part is by far the largest. And those are the legislative referenda. But before I talk about what those mean, I want to specifically say that this pie is just plain smaller than it has been in previous years. There are fewer of all of these types uh, this year, and the pie is a little bit smaller than sort of the average, which might be, instead of 147, what we have this year, more like 180. All right, let's look at legislative referenda. You might wonder why legislatures would send votes to the citizens when it's their job to be representative of the citizens. And here's a few of the reasons why that sometimes happens. That last one I think we could just call the cultural norm of the state. We could talk about any of those further if people want to ask questions for that. This chart shows the uh, number of legislative referendums from 1990 to current. You can see we are at a low mark, not the lowest, but a low mark. And the reason for that is a little uncertain, and I'm going to propose that because of the jagged nature of this, it's hard to make any clear distinctions. And it could be that this year legislators felt that they were able to get their work done just fine and did not need to send some of those measures to the voters. So I want to go back now to the citizens' initiatives that so many people think about as what's on the ballot. And these are the states in which citizens can gather up signatures and put ballot measures onto the ballot. Obviously, the green is where you can do it, and the white is where you can't. And I think there's a notable Western phenomenon going on here. But probably more important than that is the fact that this set of states with the initiative process has not changed in 20 years. It's a very stable situation. And this chart starts way back in 1904 with a number of citizens' initiatives on the ballot. And I'd just like to point out that this is not a new phenomenon. You can see that there was a big spike in the 1990s, but it's not new. We've been doing this for uh, many decades. What is interesting here is that there's the drop-off for uh, the last three years. 
And by the way, I have to admit to an error here. That final number you see is 33. It should be 35. There are 35 statewide ballot measures that came on the ballot through the citizens initiative process. But at any rate, if you take 2010 and 2012 and now this year, there's this drop off. What is that about? In the 2010 and 2012, I thought it probably represented the downturn in the economy. It's pretty expensive to get a ballot measure all the way through the process and onto the ballot. And so maybe money was what was holding it up. This year, with the economy being somewhat better than it has been, it doesn't seem like that's quite so much. So I've invented a new term, which is signature fatigue. I'm thinking that voters are less likely to sign a petition than they used to be as part of a general way of, of uh, screening out information that they don't want. Go ahead. All right, now I'm ready to talk about the specific measures that are on the balance, and they kind of fall into two categories. One is money matters, and the other is everything else. Let's start with money. As I said, minimum wage is the big story of the year. And I want to point out that the green that we've used on this slide does not represent green for money. It represents green for yes. So as we go through these slides, when you see green, it means it got a yes vote, and when you see red, it means it got a no vote. When you look at this, which one is not like the others? The answer is Illinois. Illinois' vote was an advisory vote only, more like a polling of the citizenry. Did they think that the legislature should enact an increase in the minimum wage? Illinois was unusual this year because it had three of these advisory measures, and that's uh, almost unheard of around the country, um, and yet it worked for Illinois this year. They got that yes, and on two others as well. So now let's talk about the other four where those yes votes really do change the minimum wage. All were done by the citizen initiative process, and all are um, stepped in one step at a time uh, up to uh, uh, various levels. In Arkansas, the highest pay is $8.50, which becomes active in January 2017. Go ahead. Bonds. I was surprised to see that every bond measure that was on the ballot was voted up. These varied a great deal. In California, they had a $7.12 billion bond measure that is devoted to water infrastructure. And maybe it's not a surprise that this would be getting a yes vote in a state that's been experiencing long-lasting droughts. I'm not so sure that they're at the point where people are wondering where their next shower is coming from, but I do know that they're concerned about the water supply, so they put that money in. Then the very smallest one was one of the many in Maine, and it was three billion, excuse me, three million dollars in Maine to um, uh, fund uh, biotechnology research uh, facilities. We can talk about any of those in more detail if people are interested, but from my perspective with the overall, it, it looked to me like voters were generous this year. Taxes is a whole nother deal, and the yes and the no votes don't necessarily mean yes, there will be more taxes, and no, there won't. Each of these is sort of unto itself. One that got a lot of attention is the Massachusetts vote on removing the indexing of the gas tax. So Massachusetts is one of the places where the tax that you pay at the pump goes up as the cost of living goes up. And voters voted to, un um, voted to undo that and they'll go back to what other states are doing too, which is that it has to be voted on uh, one step at a time. I think policymakers are interested in this one because many policymakers thought that indexing might be a good idea, uh, so you don't have to go back over and over and readdress this question. And they'll be looking at that vote to realize that that may not be popular, at least it wasn't popular in the base state. Again, if people have questions about any of these other tax measures, I'll be happy to address them. On gambling, this used to be a big issue on ballots, and this year I guess I'd say that it's more like a medium issue. Colorado voters soundly defeated a measure to increase casino-style gambling, but South Dakota voters did say yes to expanding gambling in one of its key tourist towns, the town of Deadwood. In Massachusetts, we've got the no vote up there, but a no vote actually means yes to gambling. The situation there was a little complicated. They had a law passed three years ago that would permit casino gambling, and this vote was to repeal that. So if you say no to a repeal, then it's really a yes to gambling. 
And then Rhode Island's measure, some say that that was in direct response to the likelihood of casinos in Massachusetts right over the border from them. Moving away from the money measures, marijuana tops the list for all the others. As I said in my introduction, voters were inclined to say yes to pot. You'll see, though, that we have a, a red for Florida, and yet 57.5% of the voters in Florida did say yes to medical marijuana. The reason that's still in the red category is that it takes 60% of the vote in Florida to do a constitutional amendment, so it failed even though it had over uh, it had the majority of the voters with them. Oregon and Alaska, it's probably no surprise to you at this point, uh, uh, proved recreational or adult use marijuana. The District of Columbia decriminalized the possession of marijuana. And I didn't put it up here, but Guam had its very first ever referendum, and it was on medical marijuana, and they voted it up. Abortion-related measures have been standard fare on ballots for at least a dozen years, and this year there were three. Two defined a fetus as a person. These are often referred to as personhood amendments, and these were voted down. In Colorado, the, that no vote was its third no vote on a personhood amendment. This time it lost by a wide margin. 35% of the voters were in favor of it, and yet that 35 was up from the previous two, which were in the high 20s. So there may be increasing uh, uh, interest in uh, personhood amendment in Colorado, at least. Tennessee's measure doesn't actually directly affect the availability of abortion services in that state at this point. Instead, this was a constitutional amendment to grant authority to the legislature to regulate abortion services. So after the turn of the year, we'll see if legislation to do just that is introduced. I think we can expect it. The top row here, I just want to say that voters are usually favorable to right to hunt and right to bear measures. On the bottom row, we've got Washington with quite an interesting situation this year. There were two competing measures on background checks for purchase of guns. One, 594, would require background checks be done for online purchases and for gun show purchases as well for retail store purchases. The other one, 591, would have pro uh, prohibited Washington from increasing any background check requirements above the federal standard. So the first one was a positive note, the other was a negative vote, the end result, background checks will be um, in front of Washington in the near future. There'll be a lot to be done legislatively and administratively to put those into place. When I was looking at ballot measures in advance of the election, I did not see that the conservation ones were going to be a significant issue. And I was wrong about that. It turns out they were. It, truly, it was in putting the slide together and seeing all of the yes votes that I realized uh, that most voters were voting for the environment this year. The exception was in North Dakota, where a proposal to use 5% of the extraction tax for parks and wildlife was turned down. This, these represent a mix of bonds and taxes and other specific measures, but yet I think we can draw that conclusion that the voters uh, were more favorable towards the environment this year than in some previous years. Ah, my favorite slide. Um, as Mark said, um, election policy is my uh, area of expertise, and so I was particularly following these. And what I notice is that they got voted down. It must mean that voters like to vote the way they're already familiar with voting. Let's look at these one by one. Oregon had the opportunity to shift from the kinds of political party primaries that we're all familiar with to a sort of new system called the top two primary. In a top two primary, all of the candidates from whichever parties run on one ballot and whichever two get the most votes go on to the general election, and it doesn't matter what their parties are. So with a top two primary, you could see two Democrats or two Republicans uh, facing off in the general election. But no, Oregon wants to stick with the regular primaries. Connecticut and Missouri each had constitutional amendments in front of them that would permit them to offer early in-person voting, and both of these were voted down. I was surprised by that because 36 states now offer some form of pre-election day voting, and Connecticut and Missouri would have been numbers 37 and 38, but that's not to be. And in Montana, the legislature sent to the ballot a question about eliminating its same-day registration option. Now, 10 states offer same-day registration where a voter can 
arrive at an office or a polling place, show proof of residency and proof of identity, get registered right then and there, and cast a ballot. Montana has had this for, um, I think, about eight years. And the question was, should they repeal that? And the answer was no, Montanans like to have that option. Now, Illinois over there on the left did do something for voting, but it doesn't really change the way people vote. Instead, it puts a right to vote into the Illinois Constitution. Education, this is another one where putting the um, checks and um, marks on here helped me see what was going on just a little bit more. It looks like people, voters weren't so positive towards educational things as I might have guessed that they would be. A couple of the negatives here, in Missouri, the question was whether teacher evaluation should be based on performance, and the answer was no. That's an issue that's percolating throughout the nation, and uh, the results of that will, I'm sure, be uh, uh, of interest to education policy specialists everywhere. North Dakota had an interesting one. They wanted to require that schools start after Labor Day, and the answer was no. And then, as you can see, the education funding ones was a mixed bag. Okay. On this slide, I've gathered up some measures that relate to who holds the power. Is it the executive branch or the legislative branch? And also some other things that relate to our constituents, state legislators. Let's start um, with Arizona. In Arizona, they have a commission to make recommendations about legislator salaries. And the recommendation this time was to increase the salaries from $24,000 per year to $35,000 per year. And it was a no vote. Now I'm going to go over to Arkansas with term limits. Arkansas has had term limits where you could serve six years in each chamber. This new measure, which was enacted, would allow legislators to serve a total of 16 years regardless of which chamber they're in. Now, Missouri. Uh, Missouri's voters uh, took away the line item veto from the governor in certain circumstances, leaving more power over budgetary issues with the legislature. Then Idaho and Arkansas had very similar measures. They would give the legislature the opportunity and the right to review administrative rules. One turned it down, one said yes. Here at NCSL, we have experts on all kinds of subject areas, and these are three that I didn't pull out as separate issues. They're all here. We can talk about what's going on with each of them. The one I do want to highlight is the Arizona right to try measure. In this era when Ebola is on the front page almost every day, I think people are um, aware that there aren't enough drugs to treat that, and so this idea that people with terminal illnesses would have the right to decide to try some either medical devices or pharmaceuticals that haven't yet made it fully through the uh, FDA process, I got a yes vote in Arizona, and we may be seeing more of that on other ballots as we go forward. And then there's odds and ends. Some of these are fun. Colorado and Oregon down there on the bottom became the third and fourth states to vote on whether foods should be labeled for GMOs. GMOs are gen genetically modified organisms. And in the past, we had California in 2012 and Washington in 2013 uh, have ballot measures similar to these, and all four have gone down, so we're 0 for 4 on this at this point. However, I believe that having it be on ballots has also brought it into the legislative arena. I know that our experts on this say that it's been an uh, increasing, increasingly hot topic, and Vermont, for one, has an, passed enabling legislation on this. Let's see, New York. New York has uh, now permitted a redistricting commission to draw up the redistricting, redistricting plans after the 2020 census. It doesn't mean that that commission has the control over it necessarily, but they make the recommendation and the legislature will vote on it. And in Massachusetts, that becomes the third state to have some form of requirement that some employees provide earned sick time for their, excuse me, employers provide earned sick time for their employees. And in Oregon, the question was around driver license cards for people who aren't here in the United States legally, and the answer was no. Before I take any questions, I just want to point out that NCSL does have a database that includes all of these ballot measures I've talked about, 
all of the ballot measures I did not mention, and all of the ballot measures going back for more than 100 years. So if any of you want to dig deep, um, it's available for you there. We also have had our um, NCSL subject area experts writing like crazy for NCSL's blog. So if you Google NCSL blog, you can go back through the last uh, four or five weeks and find quite a few um, blog posts that relate to these. Or you could just call one of us. And then the last thing I want to mention in terms of um, resources is that State Legislature's magazine will be doing a careful analysis of these for the issue that comes out on December 1st. And with that, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Our next speaker, Morgan Cullen, has worked in NCSL's legislative management program for more than seven years. He handles policy issues related to elections and legislative redistricting. Morgan serves as the NCSL liaison for the state of Alaska and the National Legislative Services and Security Association staff section. He's testified on related issue areas in state legislatures across the country and is a frequent interview guest on such outlets as C-SPAN and National Public Radio. Morgan? Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, Wendy, and good morning here from Denver, Colorado. Uh, looking forward to sharing with you a few of the insights on the 2014 state legislative elections. Um, but before I begin, I'd like to just give a quick shout out uh, and thank you to all my friends here uh, at NCSL. Um, every two years, NCSL sets up a big election night war room uh, and we stay up all night, we drink lots of caffeinated beverages, and, and we track all of these state legislative results. Um, so the reason that we have all of this information uh, here today is really the hard work of a lot of people here at NCSL, and I, I just wanted to take a second and recognize them for that. Um, obviously, this was, a, uh, this was a big year for, for Republicans, uh, and also a big, uh, big election year for, for state legislatures in general. And we can tell that just by looking at the numbers. Um, a total of 46 states held elections this year. And out of the 7,383 state legislative seats held nationwide, 6,049 of them were up for grabs in 2014. So that's 82% that's of all state legislative seats nationwide up for grabs this year. Um, if you, you can see by the stars in front of you, um, this was also a big year for governor's races. We had 36 governor's races up this year, um, and, which is much higher than we've seen in recent elections. Um, just looking back uh, to 2012, for example, uh, only 11 governor's seats were up. Um, so a lot was at stake uh, for both parties uh, leading up to last Tuesday evening. Um, and you can see in, in, in pink here, uh, the only states that didn't hold state legislative elections uh, this year were New Jersey, uh, Virginia, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Um, they hold elections in odd-numbered years. Um, and then also in Minnesota, uh, Kansas, New Mexico, uh, and South Carolina, only the House seats were up in there in, in those states, uh, and so they weren't holding uh, state Senate elections. So, um, But before we go further into the post-election analysis, um, let's look back at some of these, uh, some previous elections and, and see how we got to where we are today. So let's go back in time, if you'd indulge me for a minute, I'd just like to go back in time and, and visit the last midterm elections, uh, which happened back in 2010, um, and kind of get a sense of, of what happened. This was a, a big watershed year for Republicans. Uh, that's the year when that, that term uh, shellacking became the new big word uh, in the national political lexicon. Um, that year, Republicans picked up uh, 740 seats. Uh, and they took a majority in 22 chambers nationwide. It, it really was an historic election um, uh, for, for Republicans in many respects. And it was, it was the highest number of seats picked up really in any midterm election since 1966. Um, and it, it really altered the political landscape in a lot of ways and really kind of set up the current uh, political environment that we see today in 2014. Okay, um, if we could fast forward uh, two years later uh, to election night 2012, um, and let's take a look here, because Democrats recovered a bit um, from that, that shellacking that they took in 2010. Um, they were able to pick up uh, a net uh, 150 seats nationwide, and they were able to take back uh, three legislative chambers uh, from the Republicans. Um, Democrats that year picked up the Colorado House. Uh, they picked up the main House and Senate. 
uh, the Minnesota House and Senate, the New Hampshire House, uh, the New York Senate, um, and the Oregon Senate. Um, and the Democrats, they, they definitely had reasons to be mildly happy with their success. But if you look on the other side of this pendulum here, Republicans had a few success stories to point to as well. Um, perhaps uh, the biggest success story uh, for the Republicans that year uh, happened in Arkansas. They picked up both the House and the Senate. And that really solidified Republican control of state legislatures in the Deep South. Um, just to kind of put this into historical context a little bit, uh, back in 1990, uh, there wasn't a single state legislative chamber under GOP control. The, the South was solid blue back in 1990. But by 2012, uh, the GOP had completed a sweep across the South, and today the South is solid red. Um, and also in 2012, uh, Republicans uh, picked up majorities in the Alaska Senate, uh, the Wisconsin Senate, and, and also the, Wa the Washington Senate. Okay, um, so now let's go back, uh, uh, back in time now, I guess, uh, to last Wednesday morning um, of this week. And, and let's look at this big Republican wave uh, that we just witnessed um, uh, 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 this week. Um, you know, after the dust had settled uh, the next morning, um, Republicans ended up picking up 10 chambers nationwide that we know of right now um, and gained uh, 310 seats nationwide approximately. There's still some outstanding seats, uh, some recounts that need to be done. Um, also, I say 10 chambers that we know of because there's still – two states that are too close to call. Uh, right now, um, the Colorado Senate uh, is pending recounts, um, and also the Washington House. Uh, both of those were uh, previously uh, in control uh, by, Democrat, by the Democrats, um, and so it is conceivable that the Republicans could pick up those chambers this year and add to their, uh, their 10 chamber majority that they, that they currently have uh, uh, here in 2014. Um, but by the end of the night, uh, Republicans won the Maine House, uh, the Minnesota House, the Nevada Assembly, uh, the Nevada Senate, uh, the New Hampshire House, uh, the New York Senate. Uh, they have a complete numerical majority there. Before uh, election night this year, uh, they had a majority, but it was a coalition majority made up of uh, Republicans and some moderate Democrats that they were caucusing with. Um, but they don't now they have a complete numerical uh, majority in the New York Senate. Uh, the New Mexico House, uh, the Washington Senate, um, and then also the West Virginia um, House and the West Virginia Senate. So big year for Republicans, no doubt about it. Um, and you know some of these, these were really big gains for Republicans historically. Um, for example, the New Mexico, Mexico House uh, had been under Democratic control for the past 65 years. Uh, so this will be the first time in 65 years that the Republicans will control that chamber. Um, and then uh, the West Virginia House had been under Democratic control uh, for over eight decades. So this is the first time since the 1930s uh, where Republicans will be in, uh, in the majority in West Virginia. A um, couple of cool uh, uh, stories uh, coming out of West Virginia. One is uh, Sarah Blair. Uh, she's an 18-year-old. A college student um, that uh, uh, currently goes to West Virginia University and uh, decided to run for the West Virginia House and uh, campaigned. Her, her her campaign headquarters was stationed out of her dorm room. She lent her campaign four thousand dollars of her own of her own money and really engaged in some some uh, traditional retail politics. Knock, I'm sure she was knocking on doors all summer. Well, according to our records here at NCSL. Um, when she gets, takes the oath of office uh, this January, she'll be the youngest state legislator uh, in the country. Uh, so big story coming out of the West Virginia House. The West Virginia Senate's also interesting. Uh, by Wednesday morning, uh, the West Virginia Senate was actually tied 17-17. Uh, but yesterday, uh, Senator Daniel Hall in West Virginia uh, decided to change his party affiliation. Uh, so he went from being a, a Democrat to uh, becoming a Republican, which uh, cedes the majority now uh, to the Republicans in the West Virginia Senate, uh, giving them an 18 to 16 majority. Um, so interesting, interesting stuff coming out of West Virginia. Um, and then also 
Um, I mentioned uh, earlier the, the New York Senate becoming an outright uh, majority. The same thing is true in the Washington Senate. Um, both of them had those coalitions uh, made up of majority Democrats um, and, and some of those moderate uh, Democrats caucusing together. Uh, but they are both full uh, GOP majorities in, in both of those states. So um, I guess I guess we, we should ask the question, so how did the Republicans do so well uh, last Tuesday evening? Um, you know, if, and we spent all night kind of, you know, we were watching CNN and uh, watching the elect election coverage and um, you know, most of the pollsters that we heard uh, throughout the evening um, said it was a direct repudiation of President Obama's agenda and Obamacare. And, you know, I, and given the, the president's low approval numbers, um, I think he's somewhere, you know, around 42 percent at the moment. Um, I'm sure that was a factor, no doubt about it. Uh, but I want to point you um, also to a much more consistent trend in American politics. Um, and both parties are equally susceptible to, to this in midterm elections. Um, and that's what we're seeing in the bar graph in front of us. Uh, since, since 1902, the party holding the White House has lost seats uh, in legislatures 26 of the last 28 times. Uh, the only exceptions uh, to this rule in the past century um, are in 1934. Um, that was, you know, in the heart of the Great Depression, FDR's uh, New Deal Democrats, uh, gained 1,108 seats, um, and then also in 2002, uh, Republicans netted 177 seats. Um, and but that was and that was, that was the uh, post 9/11 election, right? Um, it was during that election when um, we saw kind of the national mood of the country was was altered uh, by this you know ma massive security threat, and and Americans really began to rally around the White House um, in response. Uh, uh, to the ter to, to the terrorist terrorist attacks that occurred, um, but really those are the only exceptions. Um, other than that, the party of the president usually loses an average of 345 seats in midterm elections, which is right around what we're seeing today here in 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 in, in 2014. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at the 2014 pre-election landscape, and let's try and get an idea of what happened here. As you can see, um, the Republican con Party had con complete control of the South, um, uh, very well situated in the Midwest. Uh, Democrats, on the other hand, are predictably dominant in the Northeast. Um, and then it's really a mixed bag of uh, party control uh, throughout the West. Um, and usually most of those states fall pretty predictably along party lines. Um, the Republicans had control of uh, both state legislative chambers in 26 states, um, which is the highest since 1928. You have to go all the way back to 1928 to find um, uh, a high water mark that equals uh, what the Republicans had coming into this election, uh, uh, and that was 27 chambers. Um, but there's only um, another interesting fact. There's only three chambers that were divided, um, uh, which you can see here. Um, they're Iowa, uh, Kentucky, and New Hampshire, and that's really low. Um, it, you have to go all the way back, actually, to 1944 to find so many, uh, so few divided uh, legislatures. Now, in uh, in terms of chambers, Republicans held 57 chambers, uh, and Democrats maintain a majority in 41 chambers. Um, now, obviously, the two exceptions to this map being, like I've indicated before, uh, the New York and Washington Senate. Um, and then again, the, the other state worth mentioning, Nebraska, 49-seat 40, 40, uh, unicameral uh, legislature. Uh, they only have a Senate in, in Nebraska, uh, and it's officially nonpartisan. Okay, uh, so what were the big 2014 battleground states? Um, there were... 17 chambers in 16 states that were uh, considered in play in 2014, um, which is actually fewer than uh, we've seen in recent elections. Um, and what was particularly, I think, worrisome for Democrats heading into November was that they simply had four – they had, they, had, they had more chambers at risk this year uh, than the Republicans did. Um, if you look at those 17 at-risk chambers, um, 11 were held by Democrats and only six were held by Republicans. Uh, so 
the Republicans really did have a, a strong advantage coming into this election. Uh, the three most, most vulnerable chambers uh, that were held by Democrats were probably the Colorado Senate, uh, where Democrats held a one-seat majority. Uh, the West Virginia uh, House, Democrats had an uh, eight-seat majority there, but you could really kind of see the political wind shifting in West Virginia uh, for a while now. Um, and uh, the, the headwinds, I think, were really helping to push um, the Republicans into majorities uh, in West Virginia. Um, although it wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, and then also the New, ha New Hampshire House, um, which has been particularly volatile uh, for both parties in the last three elections. Uh, you go back to 2010, um, the, uh, the Republicans picked up 124, 124 seats. New Hampshire has a four, is the, the New Hampshire House has a 400-member chamber, by far the largest chamber in the country. Um, and so you'll see these, we're seeing these huge swings where, uh, you know, in 2010, uh, uh, the Republicans picked up 124 s seats uh, and took the majority. Uh, then it shifted back to the, re uh, the to the Democrats in, in 2012 when they picked up 120 seats. And then this time around, um, in 2014, uh, Republicans picked up a, a 66 seats, I believe, um, and uh, that gave them the, the majority again there uh, in New Hampshire. Um, also, the Iowa Senate, uh, the Nevada Senate, um, and then uh, the New Mexico House um, were also widely considered to be toss-ups in this election. Um, what's interesting uh, to note is that the only state um, where Republicans were deemed to be truly vulnerable this year was the New York Senate. So there was only one, one, one chamber uh, that the Republicans were really playing defense on. Okay, so what happened? Um, by the end of the evening, uh, on, by the end of Tuesday evening, or Wednesday morning, I should say, uh, Republicans really had, had taken a complete route of the country's state legislative chambers. Uh, now, if you look at the map, you can see that the Republicans made gains in every region across the country. Uh, they picked up the West Virginia House and Senate. Um, in the north, Northeast, uh, they picked up the New, New York Senate. Uh, they picked up the Washington Senate. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the New Hampshire House, uh, and then they also picked up the Maine Senate in, in the Northeast. Uh, in, the, in the Pacific Northwest, they picked up the Washington Senate, um, and then uh, in the Midwest, they also picked up uh, the Minnesota House. Um, and then in the, the West and Southwest, uh, Republicans also did very well. Uh, they picked up the New, Me the New Mexico House. Uh, they picked up the Nevada um, uh, Assembly and Senate. Um, and the jury is still out now uh, on the, the Colorado Senate and, uh, and whether or not the Democrats can hang on to their one-seat one majority there. Uh, I think it comes down to one race in Adams County, uh, and it's about uh, 900 votes, and it looks like the Republicans are ahead. Uh, but um, don't quote me on that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion. Um, so really the only region where the – the Republicans didn't pick up any legislative chambers, uh, again, was in the South. And as I had indicated earlier, this was because they had already had complete control of the region coming into the election to begin with. Um, so they did very well all the way across the country. If, um, I guess I'd say if there's a silver lining for Democrats here, um, it would be that things could have been worse. Um, you know, they were able to play defense and hold on to some cham chambers in, in some very important states. Uh, the Iowa Senate, uh, the Kentucky House, um, and the Colorado House all managed to stay under Democratic control. Okay, this, this slide is kind of a reiteration of what we just saw as far as uh, chamber control uh, and what happened on election night in the previous slide. But what we're looking at is a net total of legislative seats. Uh, and what you can see again is uh, Republicans made gains uh, in terms of legislative seats in every region across the country. Uh, they picked up 93 seats in the South, uh, 143 seats in the East, 49 seats um, in the Midwest, and then uh, 30 seats in the West. Uh, again, they did very well on election night in 2014. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, so what happened? What's, this, what's, what's the legislative party control look like uh, in state legislatures um, now that the election night is over, um, 
Um, Republicans uh, uh, added the West Virginia House uh, and Senate and the Nevada uh, Assembly and Senate uh, to their column, um, and, and that brought their total state legislative control to, um, uh, to 30 state legislatures where they have total state legislative control. Uh, Democrats um, lost two, uh, so they are now at 11, um, and then the number of uh, legislatures uh, with split con control uh, um, increased substantially. Uh, it went from three chambers in 2012 uh, to seven chambers uh, in 2014. Um, Republicans now have control of 68 total chambers. Uh, Democrats have control of 28 chambers. Um, and then there's two, obviously, the Washington House and Colorado Senate that are still undecided, and then Nebraska um, is the nonpartisan state. Um, so just to kind of put this into historical context for you, uh, today Democrats have the lowest number of legislative control since the 1930s. Um, and, and in states, uh, this, is also, uh, this is also interesting as well. Um, in states where Democrats uh, were able to hold, uh, maintain their majorities, um, their numbers were also reduced. Um, for example, before the election, uh, the California Assembly and Senate, uh, the Delaware Senate, uh, the Vermont House, and the uh, Maryland House of Delegates all had supermajorities. Um, and today that's new, no longer the case. Um, so Republicans were able to make gains in those states as well. Okay, um, so let's briefly uh, uh, talk about the governor's battleground states. Um, as I said, indicated earlier, 36 governor's mansions were up for grabs in 2014. Um, and of those 36 states, uh, 36 seats, um, 29 <coughs> uh, had been held by Republicans and 21 by Democrats. Now, going into this election, um, I think a lot of pundits saw this as somewhat of an op opportunity for Democrats, um, you know, in what was widely considered to be a Republican year. Um, Democrats were widely considered to be playing defense uh, in state legislative uh, races, and, and certainly at the national level. Uh, Republicans uh, were vulnerable, though, in some key states, uh, in some key battleground states for governor's races. Um, Alaska, Kansas, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, Maine, um, all of those uh, were held by Republican incumbents, and all of those were vulnerable. Um, Democrats were considered to be vulnerable in Colorado, uh, Connecticut, and Illinois. Um, but, you know, we don't have to speculate anymore. We've got the outcome, so let's see what happens. Um, so these were the states uh, where the governor's mansion changed parties on Tuesday. Um, and it seemed like uh, all of the governor's races uh, were widely covered by the media on election night, which they were. And uh, some of them were really exciting, but most of those close races uh, that were really up for grabs ended up going to the incumbents, of, uh, incumbents uh, that were already in office. Uh, a number of Republican governors um, who were widely perceived as vulnerable uh, ended up winning election. Um, uh, Rick Scott in Florida won re-election. Uh, Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Sam Brownback in uh, Kansas. Uh, Paul LePage, Governor LePage in Maine, all of them ended up winning uh, election, uh, re-election. Um, and then also a uh, Democratic governor out here in Colorado, John Hickenlooper, won a very narrow, closely fought uh, re-election out here in Colorado as well. So um, <clears throat> Republicans, uh, the, I guess the story then is, is open seats, open governor seats. And, and Republicans were able to pick up the governor's mansion um, in four states. Uh, in Illinois, um, uh, Republican uh, Bruce Rayner uh, uh, beat Governor Pat Quinn, uh, won election there. Uh, in Maryland, uh, Larry Hogan uh, beat uh, Democrat Anthony Brown. Uh, in Massachusetts, Republican uh, Charlie Baker um, beat Democrat uh, Martha Coakley. Um, and then in Arkansas, uh, Republican Asa Hutchinson um, uh, won the governor's seat there as well. So um, the only uh, lone Democratic pickup of the night uh, went to Tom Wolf out in Pennsylvania, um, who was able to uh, to win that seat out there. But 
Um, and then, of course, we also we still have some undecided races uh, in Alaska and Vermont. Um, it, the way it looks right now, uh, it looks like independent candidate um, Bill Walker is still slightly ahead of the incumbent governor out there, Sean Parnell. Um, and then Vermont has a real interesting provision uh, in its state constitution uh, that requires legislatures uh, to decide the governor's race um, if neither of the candidate wins a clear majority um, of the popular vote. Uh, and so that's what's going on right there uh, in, in Vermont. Obviously, uh, the Vermont legislature is heavily Democratic, so it looks like Peter Schumann should win, uh, should win one for the Democrats up there. Um, so this is uh, kind of, I guess, what the current uh, governor 2015 uh, 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 political landscape uh, looks like um, across the country uh, post the uh, 2014 election on Tuesday. Okay, now this takes us uh, to state control of, um, of uh, uh, pre-election state control of state governments. Um, and there's a typo on this slide uh, that uh, we noticed this morning um, uh, where it says Republicans 25. Um, that, should, that should actually be, be 23. Um, and this is... Th this just shows us, you know, who has control of all three branches of government, um, uh, you know, House, Senate, and, and the governor's mansion. Um, and before the election last Tuesday, Republicans had complete control of state government in 23 states. Um, in, and Democrats had control of 15, and then 11 were divided. So, you know, by Wednesday morning, uh, the, G the GOP still maintained that trifecta in state government um, in uh, 23 states. Um, that, there's another typo there. Um, and, but the Democrats' uh, control of uh, state control was reduced to seven states. Um, so there's, the current political map um, is, is, is missing some blue, I guess, uh, in tw uh, or will be missing some blue in, tw in 2015. Um, and then also the, uh, the, the number of, um, of divided numbers, the divided number of, uh, of state governments uh, increased uh, substantially um, to 18 states. So in conclusion, um, obviously this was a big night for the GOP. Uh, Republicans picked up 310 state legislative seats. They could pick up more pending recounts. Uh, that are going on right now, um, and then they also picked up at least uh, state le 10 state legislative chambers nationwide. So, uh, and there there could be some more on that front as well. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, but a big night for for Republicans. Um, GOP versus GOP success. Uh, heading into this election, um, the the big question uh, wasn't whether or not Republicans would do well. It was how well they would do. And I, I think a lot of that had to do with the current political landscape and whether or not Republicans um, had reached that high watermark. Um, you know, they had a tremendous uh, year in 2010, uh, picking up 740 seats in 22 legislative chambers. And uh, the question was whether or not they would be able to improve upon that previous success. Um, and it turns out they, did, they were. They were able to do it. Um, and they hadn't reached that high water mark. Um, and they, they really, I think, exceeded everyone's expectations uh, in 2014. Um, more divided legislatures, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, this is a, a, an, 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 another important point to make. Um, the low number of divided legislatures and, and one party rule in a lot of states has now come to an end. Uh, we have split control in seven state legislatures uh, and split control in 11 states. So this January, when you start seeing members going back into sessions, um, Democrats are, and Republicans are, are now going to have to work together and compromise in 2015 in order to get things done. Uh, the days of one-party rule in a lot of these states are over. Um, and then now, all eyes on 2016. Um, you know, Wednesday morning, I think uh, a lot of Democrats probably felt uh, – a lot like I did after watching the Super Bowl last year. I remember coming into work 
And, uh, you know, we'd always just kind of acknowledge each other in the hall, but nobody talked about the game. And I think uh, that's probably um, kind of how Democrats probably felt uh, uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, not a lot of uh, uh, chat uh, around the water cooler on Wednesday morning. Um, but as in football, there's always a new season and there's always a new election year on the horizon, and that's 2016. And, uh, you know, Democrats always do better uh, in presidential years, and 2016 is a presidential year. Uh, and they've got a lot of real estate uh, to play with now. The Republicans have a lot of control. Um, and so whether or not we can see the Republic, uh, Democrats pick up some of those majorities um, uh, will be the big question for 2016. So with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Mark Wolf and see if we have any questions out there. And uh, I, I really appreciate you guys taking, taking time uh, with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morgan. Um, we, do have, uh, we do have questions. Let's go to our, some of our listeners' questions. We have 155 folks online, so we have several questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, first one is for Wendy. From Ian, to what extent did referenda drive or suppress voter turnout? Well, thanks, Ian, for that question. I don't believe that the ballot measures uh, suppressed voter turnout in any way. I think what I hear from folks is that ballot measures can drive turnout, and I've seen research that shows that it can have a 1% to 3% bump depending on what the measure is and what the state is. I've also heard that um, some states might be holding off on marijuana measures until the 2016 election for the very purpose of turnout. I can't guarantee that that's the case. But it does cross my mind that this might represent a, a good answer to why we had fewer ballot measures this year. If people want to use it for a voter turnout bump, then you wait for the, the big election. And we, we have a question from John. Uh, looks like a breaking news question. Initiative, uh, John says Initiative 1351 in Washington is now passing by 4,500 votes. Does that jibe with what we have? Well, John, I appreciate that uh, correction. We pulled it up on the Secretary of State's website, and indeed you're correct. This Initiative 1351, I didn't really talk about. This is the class size one in the state of Washington, requiring the legislature to provide the funding for a reduction in class size. And so uh, thank you. And this one from Estelle, this is another one for Wendy. These all came in during Wendy's presentation. Isn't the Missouri early voting measure more complicated than simple rejection since there was a competing and more liberal alternative that didn't make it onto the ballot? Well, now that's a good question. Uh, I was looking at the measures that did get on the ballot and so gave you the results there, which is the early voting one went down. It is fair to say that this uh, measure, this early voting measure that was voted down, offered just six days of early voting, which is pretty short in comparison to early voting offered in other states. And my thought about whether um, the voters have the, in mind that there could be an alternative is that most voters really aren't paying that close attention to know that other options are there. By the time your average citizen gets to the polls, they're just voting on what's there. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if early voting does show up back up again in Missouri based on the fact that there are um, competing ideas out there. So thank you for that one. This one is from Morgan. It, uh, it comes from Brian. Brian asks, how big a factor in recent GOP gains in legislatures is related to gerrymandered districts and will post-2020 census redistricting result in more changes? So I guess I would answer that question. I, wouldn't, I, I won't use the term gerrymandered districts, but I will talk a bit about redistricting. <clears throat> Uh, one of the reasons that the 2010 election was so significant was that it happened right before redistricting started. Uh, they picked up, you know, obviously, they picked up 740 seats uh, nationwide, uh, also 22 uh, state legislative chambers, um, and that really gave control to the Republicans um, in a redistricting year, uh, which the, the following election, the 2012, was the first year uh, that redistricting kicked in. Uh, in 37 states, uh, the, the state legislature has primary responsibility for, for redrawing uh, state legislative or uh, state legislative uh, boundaries. Um, and in, in the remaining 13 states, it's done by a board and commission. So um, did redistricting have uh, play, play a role? Uh, absolutely, um, especially in those states um, that 
um, where the primary authority to redraw lines uh, resides uh, with the state legislature. Um, so yes, definitely played a role. Um, Republicans had a tremendous advantage uh, uh, and will for, throughout the ensuing decade uh, until, till, until the uh, next redistricting cycle in 2020. Um, and then, you know, it's anybody's guess. It uh, really depends on, um, on how uh, these uh, subsequent elections uh, play out. Um, and, and, and what the political landscape looks like uh, for both Democrats and Republicans uh, going into that redistricting year. Um, but, but again, 2020 is, is, is up for grabs, and it could com completely alter um, uh, the political landscape uh, that we're seeing today. Here's another one from Morgan. Um, what are the biggest strengths and weaknesses for both parties heading into the 2016 state legislative elections? So the biggest strengths uh, for Republicans, I think, um, the biggest strength and the weakness for, for Republicans um, is the recent success that they had. Um, can they use that as momentum uh, going into 2016 um, to, to continue to, to make gains in state legislatures? Um, we'll see. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, one of the, uh, the challenges then is also uh, – that they've already, um, uh, that, you know, they could be a victim of their own success uh, in that there just isn't that, that much real estate left uh, for them to pick up. So whether or not they've picked up that and, and reached that high watermark, I think, uh, is, is the big question that uh, remains to be seen. Um, as for Democrats, um, you know, they've, the biggest advantage they have is they're going in um, – you know, voter turnout is very low this year, uh, low 40%. Uh, it's always uh, – the, the midterm elections are always lower for Democrats than they are for Republicans. So they're going to have some big advantage – they're going to have more of an advantage um, in 2016 um, in that their, their turnout is going to increase significantly. So um, – uh, but they also have a lot of uh, 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 real estate uh, that they have to make up and, and – uh, um, so, so we'll see what happens in 2016. Okay. Uh, this is from, from uh, Tom. Uh, it's for Wendy. Wendy, you mentioned the New York ballot on redistricting. How would the commission be selected? Well, now that's a pretty detailed question, but it happens I have the answer here. Uh, two, there would be a total of 10 members on that commission, two appointed by the uh, president of the Senate, two appointed by the Speaker of the Assembly, and two each from the minority leaders in the House and the Assembly. That's eight. And then those eight would choose two others that would probably uh, bring some more um, uh, redistricting expertise to the table, but those eight would have to agree on the last two members. Um, this is from Jolene. Is a copy of the PowerPoint presentation available anywhere? And it, it will be online following uh, following the uh, conclusion of the webinar. This is from Chris. Do we know how many incumbents fail to win re-election? So we don't have a clear picture on turnover data yet. Uh, we just don't have that information readily available. Uh, I'm going to put together a, a turnover table um, for chamber and state, and then we're also going to look at uh, total state legislative turnover um, nationally. Uh, and, and that'll, I'll probably have that available on our website next week. Um, I can tell you just anecdotally um, that turnover um, usually, ha is, usually is about 24% in most state legislative elections, um, and I don't see that number changing a whole lot or being uh, uh, much different than that uh, for this election, um, but we don't have uh, solid numbers uh, yet here at NCSL. And we have um, we have one more. Does uh, Pamela wants to know? Does NCSL have a list of newly elected speakers and Senate presidents from the caucus votes following the election? And the answer is we will have next week. I'm going to just jump in there, Mark. I can't guarantee it's going to be next week, but we're working on digging that information up and putting it together, and we will. Um, provided on the website to, as soon as we possibly can. And if you want to call us directly for it, we'll uh, send it to you directly, too. Thank you. Thank you both to Morgan and to Wendy and to all of our participants. 
Uh, let me remind you that NCSL's website has comprehensive information on this year's election, and be sure to look at this month's issue of State Legislature's Magazine for insight and expert analysis of the legislative elections and how they've changed the political landscape across the country. Thank you for participating in NCSL's State of State Elections webinar. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time, and have a great weekend.